Hey, 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 welcome back to RCC Sunday School. This is the Youth Ministries edition. We've been going through the 12. Grab your Bibles. We're going to finish up the book of Micah today. The 12 is the also known as the Minor Prophets, and we've been, this is our, I think, 16th or 17th lesson in the Minor Prophets if we, as we've been going through and treating them as a unit, as the 12, and Micah is the central book in that, and so we've seen some really cool things the last couple of weeks. I'm going to continue to see that as we finish up Micah. Um, he's going to, now that, that the kingdom of God, the mountain of God has been established, he's going to work on cleaning it up and making it perfect. And we're going to see how he does that today. How cool is that? So here's our list of the 12. And we are right here. Remember, chapter 3, verse 12 was in the middle. So let's go ahead and, and turn to our Lord in prayer. And then we'll take a look at what he has in his word for us today. Lord, we do turn to you. Your word is perfect. Your word is inspired. Your word reveals your plan of salvation to we who so desperately need it. And on this Easter Sunday, as we take a look at the minor prophet Micah, Lord, please give us wisdom and understanding as we look to celebrate your resurrection and recognize that you are the first fruits from the dead and that we who have faith will also follow. So help us live according to that faith that you might be glorified. Teach us with your word, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so what have we covered so far? Micah is the sixth book of the 12. It's in the middle of the 12. Micah 3.12 is the central verse. And chapter 3 ends with judgment. Chapter 4 begins with the establishment of God's house. So the first half of the 12 ends in judgment. The first or the second half of the 12 begins with an establishment of the kingdom of God. How beautiful is that? And that's really a, a reflection of everything that we see in the minor prophets. Mike is rich with salvation, rich with the Savior. As we go through, we're going to see some amazing things like we did last week and the week before. So um, there's the basic outline for Micah, the judgments for sin in the first three chapters, God's kingdom established in chapters four and five that we covered last week, deliverance and cleansing of the kingdom and God as the great shepherd of his people is what we're going to take a look at today in chapters 6 and 7. So let's start out with that. So after we've got this establishment of the king and the kingdom in in chapters 5 and 4 respectively, now we're going to get into what the king is going to show his people and how he's going to, going to clean these things up. And so God has a case against the people of Israel that he begins with here because they are they are wanting to live life on their terms rather than his. And what he's saying to them is, hey, what I've got for you is so much better than that which you seem to desire. So let's take a look at these. Let's contrast these things. So in the first two verses of Micah chapter 6, the Lord says, Here now, arise and plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Listen, you mountains, to the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth because the Lord has a case against his people even with Israel he will dispute so here's the the display and you know we saw in the first chapter that there was an address to everybody everybody take a look as I lay bare the things that are wrong and then specifically in chapter 2 God was dealing with those who were doing evil and then in chapter 3 the leaders of Israel and then we saw that that in the same way in chapters 4 and 5 first everybody was addressed to take a look and come to to the mountain of God and then the those that were that were evil had been dealt with and good was brought in and then the new leader the one who replaced the the leaders that were listening to falsehood was the king Jesus Christ and so we saw those three things answered in four and five, and now he's he's again he's appealing to the earth itself, the mountains, the foundations of the earth. Take a look at the case that I have here with my people Israel, and here's what he proposes to them. He says, "My people, what have I done to you, and how have I wearied you? How have I made you tired or worn you out? Answer me. Are is living." In, in my care and in my righteousness and, and by the law that I've given, really that difficult? 
I brought you up out of Egypt. I ransomed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, my people, the Lord says, Remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him and how from Shittim to Gilgal, so that you might know the righteous acts of the Lord. So the example that God is giving of his goodness to Israel, he gives through Moses and Aaron and Miriam. And also he gives an example of Balak and Beor, and, or Balak's son of Beor, and son like Let's start down over. Bal Balak, king of Moab, and Balaam, son of Beor. Okay, so we've got Balak and, and Balaam, and there's a the juxtaposition there as well. But let's take a look at these people and see what the provision is. With Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, of course, Moses, that's um, brothers and a sister, right? Two brothers and a sister here. And in Exodus 15, as God's people are being delivered from the slavery of Egypt by Aaron, Moses, and Miriam, there's a song that breaks out. Moses and the sons of Israel sang the song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is all highly exalted. The horse and rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my salvation. And my song, he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will extol him. So this is the song of the Israelites led by Moses and Aaron as they are coming out of the slavery that God has brought them out of in Egypt. And then, of course, at the end of chapter 15, uh, Miriam picks up that same song. And I had a quote there. I had one in there, and I don't know where it went, but you'll just have to read it yourself. Exodus 15, read the whole thing. It's the song of the people of Israel as they were delivered from the slavery to the Egyptians, introduced by Moses and concluded by Miriam, the the sister of Aaron. And so we see this provision of Moses the prophet and of Aaron the priest and of, of Miriam the prophetess that is leading Israel out of slavery. So God provided those people for that deliverance. And then in Numbers chapter 22, actually chapters 22, I think through 24 or 25 even, you've got this, this big account of Balak, who is the king of Moab, and he's seeing the Israelites come into the territory, and he's afraid of them, and he doesn't want them to be there next to him, and he's afraid he, that they're going to come and take over his country as well. And so he goes to this prophet Balaam, and he says, hey, I need you to curse the Israelites. I know that the Lord God is with you, and that if you curse them, they will truly be cursed. And so he says, therefore, please come and curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. And perhaps I may be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that who you bless is blessed, and whom you curse is indeed cursed. And he does this three times. And each time... Balaam answers him and said, I can speak only what the Lord tells me to speak. I can't just go cursing people to curse people. I'm The reason that the people that I bless are blessed and the people that I curse are cursed is because I do this in response and obedience to the Lord. And one of the times he actually had decided that he was going to try to curse Israel in response to what Balak was offering him. And so as he tried to go, his donkey saw an angel of the Lord with a sword ready to kill Balaam and kept turning to the side and even like smashed his, you know, Balaam's leg up against the wall and Balaam was angry. And so he was beating the donkey and the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and said, why are you beating me? You know, I'm trying to help you out here. And then his eyes were open to see this angel of the Lord and he recognized, okay, I need to, I need to stay right with God. And so three times, Balak came to Balaam and said, curse the people of Israel. And then three times Balaam wound up blessing the people of Israel. So we see here in Numbers 24, Balak's anger burned against Balaam and he struck his hands together and he said, and Balak said to Balaam, I, I called you to curse my enemies, but behold, you have persisted in blessing them these three times. So what God is saying here in chapter 6 is, I've provided you deliverance from Egypt, and I've provided Moses and, and Aaron and Miriam for those purposes. I've given you all of these things. And then also, those that wanted to curse you were not able to curse you, because I prevented them from doing that. And so you've been blessed 
and I take the things that are curses and I make them blessings for you. So why is it that you're seeking other gods? Why is it that you're seeking other ways that you're trying to do things that these these other nations around you that I've displaced before you that they were doing? That doesn't make any sense. Stick stick with the Lord, stick with me. I've I've got this under control. And so as we continue, then we see that God's goodness are shown not only through the people that he provides, the blessings that he provides, the freedom that he provides, but also in his requirements. Look at this. And this is a famous passage, but we need to to look um, before and after it to see the context because you know, he has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. And we quote that one all the time, but look what comes before it in, in verse 6. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before God on high? This is what the people are, are asking. Shall I come with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and thousands of rivers of oil? Should I present my firstborn? For my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. This is what the nations around were doing. They were sacrificing their own children. And God is saying, I don't want any of that. What I want is just to walk in justice and, and kindly and walk humbly. That's what, it, what we're looking for here is that we would have that relationship with God, not that we would go off and do these horrible things and then pay for them with our sacrifices. That's not what sacrifice was for. Sacrifice was an in-case thing, not because we're purchasing the ability to sin. We need to think about that even in modern Christendom because we have this understanding that if, if we come before the Lord— and we confess our sins and repent of them, and he removes our sins as far as the east is from the west, right? And so sometimes I think that we kind of bank on that. And so it's okay to do what we want. We'll just confess and we'll just be forgiven. But that's not what the Lord's looking for. Remember in First John chapter 2, when he said that, you know, my brothers, I write this to you so that you do not sin. If you do sin, then the Lord has provided one for you, the atoning sacrifice, Jesus Christ, the atoning sacrifice for your sins. But that's not the purpose. I mean, we just went through Good Friday. We should recognize the excruciating price that our Lord paid that we don't have to live like that anymore, that we can live in righteousness rather than to live in selfishness and then offer a payment for that. That's not what our Lord desires, not at all. So God's goodness is also shown through his judgment, through his provision, through his requirements, and through his judgment. In verses 11 through 13, he says, Can I justify wicked scales in a bag of deceptive weights? For the rich men of the city are full of violence. Her resonance speak lies. Their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. So also I will make you sick, striking you down, desolating you because of your sins. So those that would take from those that don't really even have and build up their own riches and look at their neighbors uh, who are starving and lie about the things that are going on there and use deceitful weights. That's a way of stealing, right? If if I sell you a pound of flour for you know, you know, a pound of flour costs... Uh, five dollars but you actually only really get three quarters of a pound and i get that five dollars right yeah it's kind of what we see in the supermarkets lately right the packages keep getting smaller and smaller and the prices keep going up and up and if we do this deceptively that's called stealing that's all that is and it's taking advantage of one another the lord wouldn't have us do that so god's goodness is shown through the people that he provides through the freedom that he provides through the blessing that he provides through the requirements that he provides and also through the judgments that he provides so then who can we and who should we trust who who should we look to as our shepherd look at, at chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 Woe is me, for I'm like the fruit pickers, like the grape gatherers. There is not a cluster of grapes to eat or a first ripe fig, which I crave. The godly person has perished from the land. There is no upright person among them. All of them lie in wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts the other without a net. And it continues on in here that there's not one found that is righteous, that, that even those that are considered righteous among us aren't really truly righteous. So what can we do? Who can we trust? Where can we go if 
we're living amongst a people that are so sinful and so selfish. And if if we're part of that people, well, we need to turn to the Lord. As for me, verse 7, I watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I dwell in darkness, the Lord, he is a light for me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Until he pleads my case and executes justice for me, he will bring me out to the light and I will see his righteousness. So even in the midst of recognizing our own unrighteousness, we can turn and we can wait on the Lord and recognize that the difficulties that we're going through now are of our own design. They're of our own making, yet the deliverance that we can look forward to and expect later come from the Lord and from him alone. And so then we will see his righteousness. And then he is the shepherd to his people. He provides all of these things for us. Then as we turn and we wait on him, rather than looking to one another or looking to to people, to human beings, to, to leaders, to human leaders for salvation, we look to the Lord our God. Shepherd your people with your scepter. Verse 14 the flock of your possession which dwells by itself in the woodland in the midst of a fruitful field let them feed in bashan and gilead as in the days of old as in the days when you came out from the land of egypt i will show you miracles so as we go through this book of micah we have this these uh um sins laid bare, that we have the evildoers dealt with, we have the leaders that are following falsehood, and then we have the mountain of the Lord established, and then we see the, the kingdom of God established with a righteous king that replaces those unrighteous rulers, and then in that kingdom, he is provided for us, and he shows how he's done this in the past, delivering from Egypt and offering blessings instead of curses giving us requirements. His, his yoke is easy. His burden is light compared to the things that we cast upon ourselves and on one another. If we, if we would just go with the requirements of the Lord, then he provides that righteousness for us. We come humbly before him and we wait on him and we see that he is indeed the good shepherd. He is the one that we can truly follow and recognize that his kingdom will last forever, that his kingdom is so much better than anything that we could ask or imagine. And that's the message of Micah, and that's the message that finishes the first half of the twelve. Who is a God like him, who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession? He doesn't retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us, he will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will see, cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and unchanging love to Abraham, which you swore to our forefathers from the days of old. God does not change. That love that he had in the beginning, he still has now. He will have forever. And so he continually works on our iniquity to bring us righteously before him that we might be truly uh, be bound together with him and we praise him for that so we finish up with that great verse from micah 7 18 who is a god like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession he doesn't retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love Amen. What a great way to finish out the first half of the 12. We will be looking at Nahum, Nahum next week, and we've got some really cool stuff to see in there. It's, a, and it's an exciting book, and you're going to see a lot of action in that book. Nahum is kind of an action movie. We're going we're gonna to see um, Ninevites, and we're going to see lions, and we're going to see all sorts of cool stuff. So tune in for that next week, but this week, Give some, give another read through Micah. Give some thought to God's unchanging love and the establishment of his kingdom and our Lord himself as the perfect king. God bless you. We'll see you next week.